This next chapter we're getting into is talking about waves. A wave is some sort of disturbance. that travels. That sounds very vague, I know. Let's start with what we call a mechanical wave. This is one I can demonstrate for you. A mechanical wave is some sort of disturbance that travels through an elastic medium. For example, if I have a string of some sort, or even just a rope, a plastic tubing, something along those lines, and I have someone holding it at the, at the far end, and I'm holding it at this left end, and we're holding it relatively tight, so there's no slack in the middle. If I lift the string up and bring it down really fast, so essentially I just shake it up and down. If I shake it up and down, there will be a disturbance in the string itself that will then travel down the length of the string. Now, to simulate this, you're probably, hopefully, have seen the FET simulations already. This is a simulation of a wave on a string. So these little circles in the middle make up our string. The reason it needs to be elastic, a medium that's elastic, is so that when one end of the string is disturbed, that disturbance then causes its neighbor to move and causes its neighbor to move and so forth. So if I create a pulse here, meaning this machine on the left just goes up and then back to equilibrium, the energy it puts into the system travels down the length of the string. This is called a wave pulse. So it's just one shake up and back to equilibrium, but we see that shake upwards travel the length of the string. Now keep in mind though, if we were to watch any of these individual dots that they have representing pieces of the string, they are not moving to the right. They are moving simply up and back down. So the medium, that's the term we use to represent the material that the wave is traveling through. Mechanical waves require some sort of material, some sort of medium for the wave to travel through. If I get this and change this to oscillations, so that that green bead on the left is continually going up and down and up and down, every other piece of this string will also go up and down and up and down. So we're watching that happen. If we were to zoom in on any one of these beads, the little spheres, any one piece of the string, I'm going to change this to slow motion for just a sec. If we were to zoom in on any one of these, it would be very similar to watching a mass connected to a spring oscillating up and down vertically. So waves are very, there's some similarities with oscillations in that here the medium itself, any one piece is going through oscillation, oscillatory motion like we've already talked about. Now, in the case of a string like this, this is considered a transverse wave. I'll write that down in just a sec. Each of these beads is traveling up and down, but the wave itself, let's go back to the pulse. The wave itself is traveling to the right. 
when it gets to this clamp at the far end, it reflects and travels back. So the wave itself is traveling horizontally. The wave is that energy, that pulse, that disturbance that travels the length of the medium. Since I have damping on, that's why that amplitude is decreasing with time. Let me turn off damping. No, it doesn't need to be slow motion anymore. So the disturbance, the wave itself is traveling horizontally here right and left but the beads these little spheres that are representing portions of the string are oscillating up and down this is characteristic of a transverse wave now the beads don't have to be up and down per se the medium just has to oscillate perpendicular to the direction of the wave travel now, a couple more things to notice before I go back to the whiteboard. As this wave pulse is traveling to the right, we see that pulse oriented upwards. So the beads are going towards the top of the screen. But when they hit that clamp at the right end, this is considered a fixed end. This top right box tells, allows me to choose what type of end I have. Any wave that hits a boundary or the end here that is fixed always inverts when it reflects. Meaning, as the wave goes towards the clamp, the beads are oscillating up towards the top of the screen, but after the, the wave has reflected off the clamp, those beads are oriented downwards towards the, excuse me, the bottom of the screen. So we call that inverted. On, I'm going to change this to a loose end, meaning it's not fixed. So that ring now at the right end is free to slide up and down that rod. When we have a loose end, the reflection is not inverted. So here the beads are up, they reflect back up. They are being inverted on the left end though, because that is a fixed end. So anytime there is a boundary of some sort where there's a connection of the medium to whether it's loose or fixed, but to a boundary, we always get some reflection. This particular app, I couldn't have no end, so it just is gone. Going off, the string goes off into that landscape and we don't get reflection because there's no end to it. So let's go back here. So a couple of things. Mechanical wave is some sort of string or a sound wave. We'll mention that as well. It's some sort of medium, some sort of material that is disturbed in some way. Case of the string, we shake it up and down and then this disturbance travels along the length of the string. As I mentioned, a string is considered, as that pulse travels, it's considered a transverse wave because the medium, any little piece of the medium, oscillates perpendicular to the direction of travel. So in the simulation, the wave itself was traveling horizontally while those little beads representing pieces of the string, those were oscillating up and down. Those are perpendicular to each other and thus it is considered a transverse wave. That is not the only way the medium can oscillate. I cannot create a longitudinal wave on a string, but I can if I had a slinky. So if I had a slinky, so a slinky, essentially a really weak spring, <laughs> 
I could just have my slinky on the floor, have someone holding this end, me at this end. So if I was looking down from above, down at the slinky, if I started shaking the slinky back and forth, this would create a transverse wave because each piece of the slinky would end up oscillating perpendicular, but the wave itself will travel the length of the slinky. So the wave is that disturbance. It would look very similar to the string if I were to shake the slinky back and forth. But the beauty of a slinky in terms of demonstrating waves, I could also take this end of the slinky and push and pull on it. As I do that, any one little ring is gonna start moving back and forth while the wave travels the length of the slinky. A longitudinal wave, that's what this would represent. The medium oscillates parallel to the direction of travel. To represent that, I have a little video. It's pretty short. I'm going to just show that. Let's find it here, my longitudinal wave. Okay, in this demonstration, we're going to look at longitudinal waves. Most of the diagrams of waves you've seen so far have probably been transverse. This is the classic sine wave that gets drawn on the chalkboard up and down and back. Uh, and that's a useful diagram, but it doesn't illustrate very well how sound propagates through the air. Sound propagates through the air as what's called a longitudinal wave. So sound is not going up and down. Sound is propagating through the air through air molecules. That you can imagine all the molecules in the air here running into each other. So those molecules get compressed and then rarefacted, and then compressed and then rarefacted. The molecules themselves do not travel through the air. They stay where they are. They just bounce off the thing next to them, and that one bounces off another one and bounces off another one. What we have here to demonstrate this is essentially a slinky suspended in a cage. And if you can imagine each little wire of the slinky representing an air molecule, what I'm going to do is start vibrating one end of the slinky, and you can see that the one wire bounces off another that bounces off another, and ultimately propagates that energy down the length of the spring. This is what's called a longitudinal wave. And it's, this is a much closer example of how sound propagates through the air. Keep in mind, though, that sound propagates equally in all directions. So sound is not a running column going through the air. So this is happening in a 360 degree sphere. But if you can keep in mind that this is how the sound actually propagates through the air, uh, it will help you as you end up staring at all of these diagrams of sine waves uh, that are inevitable, through, even through the material that we will show you. Keep in mind that sound is not going up and down, it's actually tra traveling longitudinally like this, and that'll help you uh, keep straight the physics involved in sound and wave propagation in the air. All right, so our longitudinal wave, if you noticed, some of these areas, as the wave traveled, some rings of the slinky looked really close together while some were farther apart, and then there was a packet that was closer together, farther apart. This is still considered, well, it's still a wave. These portions are compression portions where the slinky pieces are closer together, where they're farther apart are considered rare factions. As we talk about a wave, he was mentioning confusing things with the sine function. 
with this string, as we had a continuous wave, we saw kind of a general sinusoidal shape. And as we talk about waves, if we want to talk about displacement versus time, we can, the, that, rep, that is represented with the sine function or cosine function. Again, those are just shifted with, the, with respect to each other. That can be represented for longitudinal waves as well. If they're really compressed together, at these locations where they're really compressed together, the displacement is small. In the rarefactions, the displacement is big. And then this is displacement small, displacement big. So if we were to graph some sort of displacement of the medium, and by that I mean any one, well, that's not entirely true. We'll talk about that just a sec. If we were to talk about the displacement of the medium, we would have some areas that were big displacement and then little displacement to none displacement to a big opposite displacement. And so we would still end up with a function that represents some sort of sine or cosine. And so we do tend to talk about longitudinal waves pictorially in terms of a sine graph as well, because that is how mathematically those compression and rarefaction parts are represented. And so seeing the sine wave can confuse us in terms of visualizing a compression versus refraction, a longitudinal wave. So as he mentioned, a common example of a longitudinal wave is a sound wave. And we will talk more about sound. Our transverse wave, the example we saw was a string. These are not the only type of transverse and longitudinal waves, but these are the most common types that we're going to talk about. So earthquakes create waves. They actually create waves, both transverse and longitudinal waves. The longitudinal waves travel through the earth to some other location on the earth. The transverse waves are the waves that travel along the surface which tend to cause the most damage because that causes the vibration and oscillation of buildings and bridges and that sort of thing. So there's many types of waves out there, and, but we'll focus on these two main types for now. Now besides mechanical waves, so a mechanical wave is some sort of medium that's been disturbed and that disturbance is the wave that travels through the medium. We're also going to talk about what's called an electromagnetic wave. Electromagnetic wave, we often call this simply light. Now that's a generalization because visible light is a type of electromagnetic wave. By electromagnetic, we mean it has an electric field portion and a magnetic field portion that may not mean anything to you at the moment, and that is fine. Just this term, electromagnetic wave, refers to visible light. It refers to radio waves. It refers to microwaves. It refers to ultraviolet, infrared, gamma, rays, x-rays. These are all types of electromagnetic waves. Electromagnetic waves are transverse and they do not require a medium. They can travel through a vacuum, through empty space, which is good because light from the sun has to travel from the sun to get to earth for us to have that light. And there is not a whole lot of material, so medium, between the Earth and the Sun. There certainly is gases, but it's not very dense, so we often consider it the vacuum of space. 
All right, so let's talk about the equation that describes a wave. And that can be used to represent either a transverse wave or a longitudinal wave. Now, first, I would like to talk about the two types of graphs we could have. There's two ways to graph a wave. One of them is called a history graph. A history graph would be like taking a video of one piece of the medium. So if we think about the simulation we were looking at, we would zoom in on any one of those little dots or beads and watch what that bead was doing. So we would be watching the displacement of the bead up or down from equilibrium and watching that displacement over time. So essentially, like we mentioned, if I jump back here to the simulation and I cause this to oscillate, so slow motion, if you zoom in on whichever bead you decide you like at the moment, and just watch the one bead, we just see that go up and down and up and down and up and down, similar to a mass on a spring. So representing that on our graph, displacement, so that vertical axis, I mean where the bead was up or down from its equilibrium position at any moment in time. So this graph is essentially the same graph we were looking at when we were talking about oscillations. How far the bead goes up or down, the maximum distance it moves up or down from equilibrium is still called the amplitude. There's a maximum displacement from equilibrium. If we measure from one point in the bead's oscillation to the identical point, this is still the period. Period is still related to frequency. I think we wrote it as frequency as one over period before, but that's the same thing as saying period is one over frequency. Period still means the amount of time it takes for that bead to go through one oscillation. We still have an angular frequency where we can talk about radians per second. And we can still relate that to period. So A is still the maximum displacement from, equal, from equilibrium. But this history graph, we're looking at simply one piece of the medium. We're zooming in on one dot, one of those little dots in the simulation. Okay, the other type of graph is called a snapshot graph. This would be taking a photograph of the whole medium So again, coming back to this simulation, if I get this oscillating and pause. So a photograph would look something like this. If this was the moment in time I took the photograph, this is what the photograph would look like. So we would see the entire medium we could look at each of these little individual beads and how far they are displaced from equilibrium. Let me get rid of damping here for a sec and pause. If there's truly no damping, we should get the same amplitude, but not every bead is at the amplitude. Some are, some are not. Each bead has its own unique location. So in this snapshot graph, it's as if we're taking a photograph, meaning we're seeing what the medium looks like at that one single 
moment in time. Our graph that we just looked at was something along these lines. So this bead was not at its maximum displacement. This one was. This one was at equilibrium. This one was somewhere between equilibrium and maximum. And so what we're seeing is each little bead and where it is and how far it is displaced from equilibrium. So on the horizontal axis, right now I'm just gonna call that X. It means on the string, if the left end of the string, so this side is gonna be the left end of the string, Over here would be the right end of the string. And all those little beads were displaced up or down some distance from equilibrium. So X essentially means, well, how far from the left end of the string, which bead am I talking about? Where in the medium am I looking? So this bead was at its maximum displacement. We still consider that the amplitude. But this bead was at zero. And so X is just representing where along the string we're talking about. Since this horizontal axis is not time, if we were to measure from one point to the next identical point, this is not considered a period because that's not a time measurement. We call this the wavelength. We use the symbol lambda to represent wavelength. This is a Greek letter. Every wave is going to have its own unique wavelength. If I come back to the simulation, I can change the frequency. So how fast that oscillator is going up and down. And that in turn changes the wavelength. Let's do this. Maybe that will look better. There we go. That way the reflection is not messing it up. Okay, so watch what happens. If I decrease the frequency, well, let's, I guess we need some frequency. So this frequency, let's just put it at one for a nice round number. Again, photograph, if I were to measure from a bead that is at the max to the bead to the right that's at a max, that is considered the wavelength. I can measure from a bead at any one point and the next identical location bead. If I increase the frequency, say I double it, that wavelength changed. It got smaller. The distance, if we were to measure from the highest bead to the highest bead, that distance got smaller. We could also measure from the lowest bead to the lowest bead. That's fine. Similar to period, we have to measure from one location to the next identical location. Now, this is what we're seeing here with the string is applicable to all waves. Any one given wave, if we increase the frequency, we see the wavelength get smaller. If we decrease the frequency, we see the wavelength get bigger. Okay. When we want to write an equation that describes the wave, so this is the displacement of the medium. That's what this capital D represents. 
This needs to be a function of position and time. Position, because if we think about the snapshot graph, well, which portion of the string are we talking about the displacement of? That's why we need x. Well, I care about this position. But then I know that each individual bead, if I come back to the history graph, each individual piece is oscillating up and down. So just having the position is not enough. I need to know when I'm looking at it. And so that's why we have this function of both position and time. Our author chooses to write this as a sine function generically. I don't know why sine here and cosine and oscillations, but again, sine and cosine are just different starting points, so we can account for that in our phase shift. So our equation still generically has a phase shift, reminding us to account for the initial conditions. A is still amplitude. Omega is still angular frequency. The one thing that is different, this K is called the wave number. It is related to the wavelength. It is equal to two pi over lambda, where lambda is the wavelength. The sign in front of omega t has to do with the direction the wave is traveling in. In the case of our wave on the string, the negative sign means the wave travels to the, to the right. A positive sign in here, the wave would be traveling to the left just has to do with the direction the wave travels in. Now, having the position as an x, we're implying the waves traveling along the x-axis, which was the case of our wave on a string. The sound demonstration, well, it was the longitudinal wave demonstration, talked about sound, oops, sorry, goes out in all direction, all directions, so it travels outwards radially from a source. So it goes every possible direction. It would come out of the screen, into the screen. The adjustment we make in our equation is just replacing x with an r, where r means how far radially that we're talking about. So in any direction. So the equation would still look similar. It would just have kr and then the negative sign here would mean traveling uh, away from the source. A positive sign would be traveling towards the source, which really wouldn't make much sense because sound's not going to, sound only travels away from itself, from the source itself. All right, so basic fundamental equation, we can write it in terms of a radial distance if the wave is being emitted three-dimensionally. We can write it in terms of just x or even just y if we were talking about um, the wave traveling along one line. And so the next video, I'll start talking about some other relationships for waves and what determines how fast the wave is traveling and so forth. Actually, let me give you one other equation really fast. Wave speed. The speed at which a wave travels is equal to wavelength times frequency. Now this is one of the hardest equations you're gonna see. I chuckle because it's obviously not hard. It's a really simple basic equation.
it's hard in that if I change frequency, I do not change the speed. Frequency does not affect V here. This V cannot be changed by changing frequency. But if you think about what I was just showing, if I increase frequency, we saw the wavelength get smaller and vice versa. When I decrease the frequency, the wavelength got bigger. So that was on here. If I increase frequency, that wavelength got smaller. If I decrease the frequency, well, I didn't mean to turn it completely off. Decreasing frequency causes an increase in wavelength. And that's because the frequency does not, well, nor does the wavelength. The frequency and wavelength do not determine the speed of the wave. Okay? That's why I say this is a hard equation. Because we naturally want to be like, oh, if I increase something on the right side, then the thing on the left side increases as well. That is not the case. If frequency goes up, wavelength goes down because the wave speed in any one given medium, that speed is constant. The medium itself determines the speed of the wave. So we'll talk more about that as we go along.